he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. So this moment marks a first in my life. And in a way, it marks a first in your lives too. I have never preached a sermon on this passage of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And so you've never heard me preach a sermon on this passage of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And being completely honest with you, I have avoided it for years in my ministry because um, I intensely dislike foot washings, which often accompany a sermon on foot washing. Um, I find them really uncomfortable uh, and both in having my feet washed which has happened to me and and also in washing someone's feet and yes I've participated in that I've been in situations where I wasn't the preacher but I've had both of those uh, things happen where I've been the recipient and I've also washed people's feet and I dislike the whole endeavor and that says more about me than it does about foot washing. So please don't misunderstand me. Foot washing, as we see from Christ here, is a, a wonderful, beautiful thing. It's my own ego and uh, neuroses and sin and darkness that is still struggling with it. So I've avoided preaching on the passage because it often does seem natural that a foot washing would follow. Well, with COVID protocols in place, I figured this would be a good year to preach this sermon because we can't actually have a foot washing right now. And I know that's actually pathetic of me. Um, I'm just not there yet on the foot washing. Well, that little confession, <laughs> revelation is yet another of my character flaws. Um, what Jesus does here, what he shows us, it cuts me to the core. Now let's take a closer look at what's happening in this passage. Peter, as we heard from the beginning of the message, he refuses Christ, right? He says, you're not going to wash my feet. In effect, Peter is saying, Jesus, you're Lord, you know, you're you are Messiah, you're Christ, you're not a servant. That, this is for the lowliest servants to wash people's feet. You're above this, you're the big cheese. Here, I know. let's get Judas or James the lesser to wash the feet. You shouldn't be doing this. Don't concern yourself with this menial service. Well, how does Jesus respond? Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Wow, that reverses things right quick, doesn't it? And Peter, good old Peter, comes back and says, uh, you know, he's, he's all in, as Peter is. Well, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head, you know. And taking the washing Literally, Peter misses the point, but I understand his enthusiasm. He wants full connection and communion with Jesus, right? I mean, that's that's why he says what he says. If this what it mean, if this is what it means to be part and parcel with you, then yeah, give me the whole thing. If washing is how we connect, wash all. Of me. Well. Of course, what Jesus is actually telling his disciples 
and we saw this a bit on Palm Sunday as he enters into the city and refuses to take kingship by force. He's telling his disciples that his kingdom, this Messiah King, serves rather than demanding service. His words for P Peter and to us say, if you can't receive me as a Lord and Savior who serves, then you don't understand me. You, you haven't gotten who I am and who God is. How can you be my disciple if you don't see that? That I have come to serve, not to be served. Well, that's something for us to think about. We are here worshiping God. Unconsciously, we most likely arrive when we worship, wondering more about our service to the Lord rather than his service to us. Maybe we agree that he served us in those days and certainly on the cross through Jesus, what he's done. Yes, he's done something, but... Do we regard Christ's service to us, God's service to us, as being over? Was it something that he did once, or does it continue? Is the character of God a love that always gives and serves, or did something one time in history, and now it's just up to us? Does God's love always give and serve us and not just us but everyone i mean unless i've missed something he washes judas's feet right the one who will betray him the one who doesn't buy what he's selling who wants to take things by force who's going to go force his hand jesus doesn't kick him out he says, you got to go do what you got to do, but Jesus doesn't refuse him communion or washing his feet. And perhaps that's why this cuts me to the core. Tangible, honoring, even humiliating service for others, including those folks that I may not particularly care about. That's who Jesus is. That's what he does. And I call myself a follower of Jesus. I'm his disciple, and I struggle mightily with following him. However, I miss the point of worship if I leave here believing that the purpose of worship is an evaluation of my discipleship. Did you hear that? I miss the point of worship when we gather before the Lord if I leave here believing that it was all about evaluating how good a follower I am. Not that that is unimportant. Obviously it's important. But it's not the reason we gather to worship. Instead, our attention refocuses upon Jesus, upon Christ, and off of ourselves. We acclaim him as the one who carries no prejudice but serves. He forgives offenses against him and serves. Even when our hearts are far from him and our hearts are far from the beauty of his kingdom, like Judas's must have been, he serves. Monday, Thursday. Monday, it's a shortened form of of a Latin word, which I'm not going to pronounce because I'll mispronounce it. But it's a shortened form of a word that means command. Command Thursday. What's the command? Well, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And that Really, that's the core of our faith. This word of love became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus not only shows us 
the character of God, he shows us the nature of his kingdom. If we're to live out our citizenship under his reign, it's going to be through love and humility. That's just the way his kingdom works. Well, finally, there is something I simply want to point out about this scene from the upper room. And that is, notice that Jesus, although he knows there is a betrayer in their midst, he knows, he talks about it openly. Even though he knows, he does nothing to stop Judas's actions. What I want you to consider is what that must have been like for the disciples, right? Jesus mentions this treachery. There's one of you who's going to betray me, and they begin to wonder who it might be. And then he does nothing. He does nothing. What do you imagine they were thinking? Why doesn't he expose the deceiver? Why doesn't he, as good old Deputy Fife says, nip it in the bud, right? Nip it, nip it. Stop this. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. There are things we will all continue to um, marinate in as it comes to the love and humility of his kingdom. That is our faith to be conformed into the image of this Messiah who serves and loves even when we don't understand. Amen.